Guys, what's up? It's the 3M Podcast. My name is Charlie. My name is DJ. My name is Sean. Uh, we're just a group of friends. Tell spooky stories. Tell fun, funny stories. Everything in between. Today, we're doing a deep dive. Ooh. But before we get into stories, we're going to chat a little bit. So if you're interested in the stories, go ahead and look in the description below at the timestamp. Skip right to the stories. But if you're a real one, hang out with us. Bro, last week, uh, I was listening to the episode, and I was like, we tell spooky stories, we tell scary stories. <laughs> It's like, you dumbass. <laughs> I didn't even like hear myself say that. Um, lots have, lots has happened since we last recorded. Last time we recorded was with Tristan. Damn. It's been a no, good No, not the last time. Yeah. Last time we released was with Tristan. Yeah, you're right. You're so right. what happened? We did record. Sean was out of town two weekends in a row. Uh, we, had a, we had a basement flood. If you follow us on Instagram, mm-hmm. you saw that, which was terrible. Let's start there. Tell us all about it, dude. It was just, it was just, I was, it was a miracle that I caught it. A blessing and a curse, dude. Yeah, it was a, it was a Friday night. I had plans. I just wasn't feeling it and I decided to stay home. I had some work to catch up on. So I was just, I had music going in the studio and I was just working and it started raining. Like I heard it on the window and I was like, damn, I haven't heard it rain this hard ever. And I took out my phone and I looked at the weather app. And it says clear skies. <laughs> oh, no. What's going on here? Like, <laughs> Something's not right. So I ran outside and <laughs> I see just water. Like, you know, you know, the Bible story with like Moses. He like hit the rock he with his staff. Smote, <laughs> smote that shit. And like water just came out of the rock. Yeah. Yeah. That was the house. Water was just coming out from the wall in between like the wall and the window well right where the studio was. So I like ran. It, it was only me and my brother's home that night. And like I said, it was a miracle that I was in the studio because if I was even here in the living room watching TV or something, I would not have heard it. True. So um, what would have happened? Can you kind of like how serious was that shit? Like it um, was filling up the window well? Oh, yeah. Like uh, <laughs> if you, like a uh, PTSD well, right it was, now. Yeah. <laughs> Sean's like, and, uh, Sean's sweating. And if you've been with us long enough, you know that we flooded a, a little over a year and a half ago. Like the whole the whole basement flood, and Sean was here for that. He, he lost his Chipotle, um, <laughs> but I caught this one. It was in the studio, and it was coming out like when we started bailing out the water. One regular like bucket, like Home Depot bucket. I don't know how, how many gallons is that? Ten, five, ten. five, ten gallon bucket. The Home Depot, yeah, yeah that's a five gallon bucket. Five gallon bucket. Yeah, you'd hold it under the water stream for like fifteen seconds at most, and it'd be full. Oh, so it's, it's coming so, quick. Yeah. Gushing. Right. So like I run upstairs to my brother. One of them's taking a nap. It's seven o'clock at night. <laughs> it's already dark. It's winter here in Utah. It's cold outside. Outside it's like oh. 30 degrees. And then my other brother's playing FIFA. So I like get into the room. I say, quit your game right now. I need your help. My brother, he's like, when you wake up, Sean, you know when you wake up from your nap and it's late? Oh, and, and you're, you're like, like, what universe am I in? Whoa. Yeah, now add a flood on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's biblical, bro. Yeah, exactly. So We're I the said, animals two by two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, f- Get the cats. And uh, my one of my brothers is just like, he takes his time he, with he, a lot of things, which is good. He goes to the beat of his own drum. Dude. Yeah, which is good. Not in this situation. <laughs> so I'm like trying to call the shots. I'm, I'm like trying to find like an emergency plumber. Mom and dad is gone. Uh, and like I tell them, jump in the window well, start bailing buckets. I'm going to try to find some pumps, which we had from our first flood. I'm trying to set that up. I get some. We need an extension cord. I'm like, Bubba, go get an extension cord right now. And he starts walking away. <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> Bubba, run! I need you to run right now. I'm like yelling at him. I was like, "Go get an extension cord, hurry!" And he like double times. He walks times. faster. Yeah, well, he walks faster. <laughs> anyway, we get that situated, and we have three pumps. Two of them don't work. Oh, and of course, it's the third one. That's when you're trying to find the right key yeah. and shit. Yeah, and it's like, well, I have my. Well, it's like we're in the part of like outside of the house where there's no lights. It's like on the oh, back side of the house. Yeah. So like the back porch is lit, the front porch is lit, but like. The side of the house isn't lit well enough. And how cold is it? Pretty cold. It's not freezing because it was it, it was a it was a burst pipe. But yeah, that, it's that's why thirties, thirties, forties. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it was freezing. Like the beginning of that week was the coldest we had this whole winter in Utah. Like, like single, like nineteen degrees. No, shit. no, lower. It was like three degrees. I, I oh I, yeah, uh, catch here, a train to work. Down, yeah, single digits up here. I ca- I catch a train to work and walk two blocks from the train station, and it was miserable. Damn. Walking those two blocks, and I, yeah. I I have like really high tolerance for the cold. Missing Oahu, bro. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it warmed up later in the week, and that's when the pipe burst. So that that's what we got. Where were we at? I had like my since it wasn't lit very well. Like we had our phones, 
and my phone died. Oh, and then I take no. baby's phone. <laughs> his phone dies. So we only have Bubba's phone. Bro, God wanted you to drown. I know. Bubba. It was uh, <laughs> so insane. Long story short, I got the pumps working. They were mitigating it with my brothers, like also bailing out water manually. And me, like, they're like, they're talking about, like, oh, we're hungry. So I'm like, I, look, I, I order pizza. We live in the boonies. We li- you have to ca- cross a cattle grate to get to our house. It's so, like Pizza Hut doesn't even deliver to our house. So I have to get a DoorDash. So it's more expensive, you know? <laughs> so I get some pizza for them while they're cold and wet and bailing out water. You're a good brother, dog. And like trying to call like, uh plumbers and they're like oh you guys live too far we don't do service out there and the ones who can they're like oh uh the next availability like everybody's pipes are bursting right now like you guys aren't the only one i'm like okay i get it it like the 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 next appointment we have is a thursday i was like the water's coming out right now (laughs) what am i gonna like it's friday night i can't wait six days you know um like just keep bailing bro yeah i i turned off the water too uh, inside it wasn't inside it was external so i ended up calling the city and they came down um and they turned off the water and that solved it and then i found the pipe the next day and patched it up and turned the water back on damn so what's that fool called it was like fix it ralph or some shit fix it felix fix it felix oh, and they look at ralph J- it, little ralph. guy he's like john bob the builder yeah bob dude. john the baptist <laughs> <Yeah. What> the <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of bro <laughs> he was dude, yeah. baptizing y'all <laughs> that's crazy bro yeah so so we lost everything in the studio is that what you're saying yeah Pretty everything much. i bought a brand new computer and camera and audio <laughs> at equipment. at least you didn't no. lose your chipotle no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. no luckily like water got into the studio but it wasn't like flooded flooded it was like if you stepped in certain parts of the room on the carpet like water would seep up Ugh. so so because you were in the just, room you were right there ground zero the only thing happened was it completely soaked the carpet and then DJ, super jump into action, got all of our gear out. And there's a lot of gear. So yeah. he, he got it all out here in the living room. Had some help. Saved everything. <laughs> Miranda came over the next day and helped. That's really sweet of her. Um, Shout out, Miranda. Uh, and we had a ton of people reach out to us and they were like, do you have a Venmo? Do you have a uh, cash app? Like, uh, do you guys need any gear? Like legitimately somebody, plus people. Somebody was like, what can I What can I do so it doesn't happen again? Yeah. <laughs> was like, that one I was like, you can go f*** yourself. <laughs> I was like, get us a new house, dog. <laughs> yeah, we didn't yeah. ask for it. DJ brought up a point. He was like, last the first time the house got flooded, it flooded everything but the studio. And then this time it flooded the just only, the studio. Just the studio. And yeah. I said, uh, you ever seen uh, Final Destination? It's like they escape death. Oh, <laughs> so shit, everything like dude. works until like it, it kind of covers itself. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so okay, so that leads us into our next point. Yeah. We don't have a studio. Sean's out of town. He's going to Moab. Where else did you go? You went to New I York. I was in New York and then Moab. <laughs> yeah. Excuses, not really New York. No, there was New York one day. Yeah, <laughs> the the rest of it was New Jersey. But you got bamboozled. I got bamboozled hard. And we talked about that. So <laughs> we don't have a studio. Sean's out of town. So DJ, we're like, man, let's uh, let's do something we've wanted to do for a really long time. Let's record out in the wilderness, like out and about. So we went and set up this beautiful spot, mountains in the background, nice. And we recorded a two hour long episode out with in Reed. the cold, bro. Out in the cold, it was thirty four degrees. And Damn. it was an amazing episode, bro. It was funny. <laughs> DJ had jokes. I had banter. <laughs> I had the stories. And it was like, we covered everything, bro. And the worst thing happened possible. We finish. DJ reaches down to turn off the, the recorder. And as he does that, it just goes dead. And he's like, whoa, it just died. And I was like, oh. We, we put brand new. We went <laughs> to the market right before to like get some, get some drinks and some new batteries. And we put in a f- <laughs> fresh pair. Yeah. Right before I hit record. And then it still died. And yeah. it's like, we we didn't even make it two hours. <laughs> Which it should last like eight. So we don't know. Maybe it was too cold. Oh, uh, yeah. We don't know what happened. Batteries do die faster in the cold. Okay. Does it? Yeah. Why do people put batteries in the in the refrigerator? I have no idea. Oh, I was like, who puts a battery? Like, I thought you meant like to power the refrigerator. Like some people <laughs> oh, no, put, no, yeah. put batteries like in a Ziploc baggie in the, in the refrigerator. I heard that's like old wives tell shit. I was going to say, yeah. like from my experience... Stuff dies faster in the cold. Like, kind of makes sense. I go camping with my phone fully charged at night. In the morning, it's going to be forty. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Actually, true, 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 true. Mm. But anyway, we get home. We like. <laughs> hopefully, we didn't lose everything. We lost everything. Oh no! DJ worked for like an hour to try to salvage it, reformat it, like re-export it, like everything he could. We could think of. We lost it all. So this. So the stories and the things we're going to cover tonight 
we already recorded. <laughs> and so it, we, DJ and I talked about it. It's really hard not to make the same jokes and shit. Do it. Yeah, but it's like so hard. <laughs> like, dude, I don't know. So you Bro, might. This is Final Destination. Yeah. You might hear us kind of like uh, revisit things yeah. we've already talked about. We're not I mean, it. they won't know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but anyway, so. That was our that was our last two weeks. So. <laughs> but yeah. Did we have anything else? No, I say we get into it. All right. You guys down? Yeah. I've been watching, I've been rewatching like almost every Rogan episode again. It's nice. been a, I kind of fell out. There's a lot of those. I know. Well, I, dude, I'm up all night, baby. So it's like, <laughs> I literally just watch so much shit. Anyway, there was a really long time where I listened to every episode of Rogan. Then I fell out, kind of missed like half a year, but now I'm like every episode. He has had several guests on recently that I was like, this could be a whole 3 a.m. episode. Yeah. So I'm going to suggest some to our listeners. If you like our content, uh, you might enjoy these episodes. Uh, the first one is with John Reeves. Did you have you listened to any recently? I don't know their names. If you tell me what they talk about, I probably will recognize it. Dope. John Reeves is a really rich dude in Alaska. Who, okay, yeah, I did listen to this the, one. Like the Mammoth Boneyard. Yeah, he talked. Did he also talk about wolves? He talked about like everything. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember the wolves part though. So Jonathan Reeves like moved to Alaska a long time ago as a young dude, I think with some friends. He was kind of like a dirtbag. Uh, he purchased a like a plot of land and it ended up having a ton of oil on it. So now he's just like insanely rich and uh, yeah, it kind of lives his life and he's very yeah. like independent, doesn't want to talk to anyone, doesn't want any fame, <laughs> doesn't want any like outsiders bothering him and stuff. But on his land, there is a huge like ice shelf or something mm -hmm. and like the side of these banks are just like ice and mud and dirt mm -hmm. and at some point in excavating his own land he realizes there are bones all over his land and he sprays the side of like this bank and mammoth bones uh saber tooth tiger skulls all this shit falls full out. on graveyard <laughs> he yeah a huge graveyard of extinct animals all in this one spot and he's like i've only looked at a small percentage of my land. So he's sitting on a treasure trove of like evidence and uh, history and fossils. And he like won't talk to anyone except Rogan. So he was like, Rogan mentioned his name once his like followers grew exponentially. And so mm -hmm. he was like, I won't talk to anyone. I'll only talk to Rogan. He, I think he's kind of like anti-establishment. So he like okay. doesn't trust I get media. That. I get he's that. like, I'll only talk to Joe. So Joe finally had him on. And basically like uh, up until now, accepted science was like there is no saber-toothed tigers in alaska in on the that that uh ice shelf yeah the bearing land straight there's like mm -hmm. they weren't up there there was a different type of saber tooth or a, a different type of cat like large cat, cat up yeah, there yeah, yeah. but not saber-toothed tigers and he's like really because i have like 30 skulls <laughs> so he's like rewriting science history yeah yeah which that's got to be so hard in and of itself what to rewrite history yeah, so the, the finding like conclusive evidence true. showing that everything that we thought was actually something else. Yeah, and apparently like uh Rogan has a lot of scholars and people on who talk about the resistance to that. Yeah, what is So there's like established academia, scholars, writers, peer reviewed like there's like a club of them and they've based their whole reputation and whole life off of what they know and what they believe. Right. Mm -hmm. So anything that challenges that they're very wary and they treat it as like woo or nonsense. You're crazy. That makes sense to me though. That's scientific method. It's like to have that like thought or to like the, 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 the approach. Cause it's like, even if you have one solid piece of evidence, but that going up against like a body all of the, work the, the body of work showing that you know showing the other way around it's like i feel like they'd want more to disprove rather than just the one so I maybe not fully like rejecting it but it's apprehensive like you can't like just totally jump ship that makes sense but i think uh there's a rigidity to it that is like extreme for instance We've talked about this on pod before, but Gobekli Tepe is one of the yeah. biggest, craziest archaeological finds that has happened in our lifetime, maybe rivaled by what's happening in the Amazon right now. Okay, but yeah. Gobekli Tepe was found in Turkey, and it's an underground site, and it's dated to a time where academia will say humans were no more than like hunter-gatherers in small tribes. And then this thing, like you can't, what I'm saying, DJ, is like Gobekli Tepe, you cannot deny. 
Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's not like some small arbitrary uh, detail that's found. It's like in your face site that is like just shits on the do timeline. They, do they deny it? There's people who like push back and there's people who like uh, won't talk about it. And the reason I know that is because there's a guy named Graham Hancock who has also been on Rogan. And mm-hmm. I'm not sure how interesting this is. We're kind of going down some alleys, but whatever. Graham Hancock has been on Rogan for a really long time. And for a really long time, he has been an outsider ostracized by academia mm-hmm. for his ideas. And his main idea is that mankind has advan- mankind is much older than we think. And it has advanced way further than we think and Mm -hmm. then has been brought down by natural disaster or or whatever it is, a comet. I think that a lot of people just ostracize him, though, because he's not a scientist. He's a journalist. He's like an investigative journalist. And people look down on that, which is weird. But still, yeah, like that's at least what I have kind of gleaned from that whole hundred percent situation. So they're, they're another example of this rigidity. And like, I get what you're saying, but I also disagree in that. I think science should seek the answer, not assume it has the answer. So if new evidence does come up, you should be open to it, understand it, uh, digest it and see how it fits into the narrative or changes the narrative. Yeah. They won't even look at it. So there's a guy who kind of controls archeology span in Egypt. He's, I can't remember his name. He calls the shots and he, it's like, Getting things done archaeologically in Egypt is very difficult. Like the government will not like okay anything. For instance, he did a like a special that aired on TV where he showed the tunnels under the Sphinx. Mm-hmm. But this is back in like the 90s, early 2000s. Before they blocked it all off. Then they block off all the tunnels under the Sphinx. And anytime people ask him about the tunnels under the Sphinx, he calls them like conspiracy theorists. You're crazy. You don't know. There is no tunnels under the Sphinx. And he like denies it adamantly even though he had a special that aired yeah. on tv showing the tunnel so just stuff like that i'll show you a tunnel in the sphinx ah. <laughs> thank you uh za someone just said it in chat uh car Zahi hawas yes he's the fool he gate dude he, perfect way to put it he's Egyptian the gatekeeper keeper emo tap <laughs> yeah <bro. laughs> anyway where was i going with this gobekli tepe so they find gobekli tepe it's an underground system that can hold like 50,000 people. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. They have carvings on the walls that are showing animals that weren't like on that continent. And the carvings are relief, like a a form of art that they, that wouldn't exist until like thousands of years later. Yeah. And it dates back to way older than we thought. So just stuff like that is disrupting the narrative. And I love that stuff. So anyway, this guy comes on John Reeves, he his land he just has so many bones like millions and millions of bones yeah and how did he get this land in the first place he like bought just it a bought long it? time ago i i'm not too positive but i'm pretty sure he like bought From it like way russia back. or something <laughs> <laughs> just like alaska bro they in the 70s like no one lived there and they wanted people to come up there so i'm sure they were just like yeah like 50 bucks take take like a thousand <laughs> acres you know what i'm saying don't quote me on that probably which they're by the way they're paying people to go to visit hong kong right now to stimulate the economy they're also like paying people to come and live in castles in italy or something bro what the f- are we, gotta, we doing I bro? <laughs> getting flooded in a basement <laughs> yeah it's like damn we just suffering in a basement in utah when we could be living in castles in italy <laughs> another guest that rogan had on recently was similar vein it's jimmy corsetti and ben van Kurek. Go listen to that episode. Super fun. Uh, Jimmy Corsetti is Bright Insight on YouTube, and that's where I got my whole wrist shot structure, uh, okay, Eye yeah, of the yeah. Sahara. So that's a really fun episode. They dive really deep into like uh, how the narrative of archaeology is like there's probably more to it. And they draw all these parallels. There is building tactics that are the same in Peru, that are the same in Egypt, that are the same in Japan from thousands that of years, date, yeah, hundreds or thousands that. of years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's like, how is that? The Anunnaki, I dude? Mean, it could be the Anunnaki. <laughs> it only comes around every couple hundred thousand years. They, mm-hmm. So it could be alien intervention, or there was just like humans were way more advanced than we think. They weren't just like huddling by fires and caves. It's like they might have been traveling this whole bitch, this whole world. It's you true. know what I'm saying? So wait, that's a really fun episode. The last one, uh, Forrest Gallant. He was on Rogan recently. If you haven't listened to it, I feel like you specifically would love it because they talk about like uh, cryptids and... Uh, oh, I do. F- I follow him on Instagram too, actually. I'm like, why does that sound so familiar? What What does he do? What has he found? Um, so Forrest Gallant, Reed kind of did a deep dive into him. I can't remember specifically. He grew up in Zimbabwe, I think. 
and uh, he was like the youngest person ever to lead their his own expedition in Africa. He is like um, proven that they're to find what I don't know. I can't. Reed had all these details. Mm. Reed was on the episode and he covered this part, so I apologize. He's dope, actually. Um, Forrest Galantis. He's yeah. uh just knows a sh- ton about like all kinds of animals. Like I literally saw something today that he was talking about like grizzlies in Mexico. What? Whoa. Yeah. Whether like up in the mountains where people just don't go Mm -hmm. and farmers are talking about how their cattle are being mutilated and they know it's not mountain lions. Chupacabra. There was a uh, species of silver grizzlies or something like that that lived up in the mountains of Mexico or something like that. He was talking about today. grizzlies? Bro, that would be so terrifying. (laughs) What the f***? The the alpha land animal. (laughs) I can't remember what his title is. It's like eco... Damn, I don't know. He has a podcast that he goes on as well where he talks about just strange animals all over the world. It's kind of cool. Yeah. And he's like, he's specifically responsible for proving that I think like seven species of animals aren't actually uh, extinct. extinct. Yeah. So is the Tasmanian he, tiger on there? So that's one of them. There, the Tasmanian tiger is right now, everyone says it's extinct, but there's a lot of people who claim they've seen it. And it, the the official name is the thylacine. Mm-hmm. So the thylacine, I think, originated in Papua New Guinea. And a couple thousand years ago, Papua New Guinea was connected to Australia. So the thylacine, like, originated Land Papua wise? New Guinea. Yeah. When there was way more ice on the world, like on planet Earth, like, there was so many more land bridges Pre, everywhere. Pre-Greta Thunberg. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> uh, yeah. Have you ever heard of Sunderland? Sunderland. No. Bro, Not like, off the top of my head. Thailand and the Philippines and all that was all one. It was all this huge place called mm. Sunderland. Damn. Damn, it's it's crazy. You can like see the map of it, but everything's Pangaea. Yeah. So anyway, uh, thylacine originated in Papua New Guinea and it went south. And then over a really long time, they introduced the dingo. They hunted the the Tasmanian tiger, and it went extinct. Mm-hmm. You can still see footage and videos of the Tasmanian tiger. It's one of the craziest looking animals. It's creepy, yeah. It's like a jungle zebra dog thing. <laughs> Hybrid, weird. Yeah. The back of it has stripes like a tiger. The front of it, really elongated snout, and its jaw can open like 180 degrees. Mm-hmm. It's wild. It's crazy looking. It looks like like, like a child's drawing. Yeah. Of like it, what yeah. they think. Yeah. It's a fever dream of yeah, an it's animal. It's like telling a five-year-old to draw a and it's exactly what memory. it is. Yeah. 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 That's a great description. But a lot of people claim they still see it. Mm. And it's like how remote Papua New Guinea is. There's literally no way that it is charted or traveled enough that 100%. we would know. Yeah. It's so remote, so untraveled. And there's like parts in Tasmania, Australia, where people still think they've seen. And he, he names like a really famous um, environmentalist who is like forest. I have no reason to lie to you. I saw one like 10 years ago. And he's like, I've been on the hunt, hunt ever since. What? So Forrest fully thinks like they. There's also stories of two breedable Tasmanian tigers who were being sent to America. They were going to the uh, New York City Zoo or something like that. So back in the back in the Dizay, it was like early 1900s or something like that. I don't know. Something like that. It was a long time ago two thylacine that could breed like a male and female were being sent to New York. And on the way, the boat crashes and all the animals get loose. Where? It crashes where? Somewhere on the East Coast. Oh, okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. Like Carolina no, that sounds, or something? That, that like, sounds right. I want to say it was more Northern though because I like, do want to say the that. sightings of these thylacines now have been more North like, like Pine Barrens or like Catskills and stuff like that. Yeah. And so anyway, they think that the thylacine, those two thylacine could have gotten out, bred, and they could have been the or- originators of some cryptid or yeah. chupacabra-like animals. Exactly. Because that's also around the time that it, the chupacabra starts popping up yeah. in the Americas. I actually do. That was a fun episode to listen to, like Forrest Galant. Yeah. It's really fun. So anyway, this sent me down a spiral. This sent me down a path uh, where I wanted to do a deep dive on a subject and I love the idea that there are still mysteries in the world. Mm -hmm. I think this is what attracts me to conspiracy theories. I love the idea that we don't have all the answers because if we live in a world where we have all the answers, it's boring to me. I want, I want there to be mystery. 
And there, there's a specific scene from a movie that really affected me as a kid that has to do with this. And it's from, it's a scene, a specific scene. Literally, it's stuck with me ever since. And I think about it quite often, and I'm not joking. It's a scene from The Truman Show. <laughs> so you guys have seen which it. Which one? Yeah. What's up, DJ? Which one? No, which scene? <laughs> oh. <laughs> not, not which Sorry. Truman. Truman Show one. <laughs> so Truman is in school as a kid. Oh, and okay. his teacher's asking the class, what do you all want to be when you grow up? Do you remember Truman's answer? I want to be an explorer like Fernand Magellan. Damn, this fool from memory, bro. Yeah, I actually have it right That's here. That's sharp. I'm going to play it. I like to be an explorer like the great Magellan. Magellan. Oh, well, you're too late. There's really nothing left to explore. Damn, bro. Bullshit. So that's what the teacher. If you don't know, Truman Show is about a guy who is, lives in a controlled environment where they're filming everything. Gave me way too many complexes growing up as a kid. <laughs> um, so he he grows up. Every aspect of his life is being filmed. He's being controlled. And it's viewed as a TV show on the outside world. Mm-hmm. And so in order to control Truman and to keep him trapped in his bubble, mm-hmm. when he expresses that he wants to be an explorer, his teacher responds by pulling the map down and saying, you're too late. Everything has been discovered. Mm-hmm. And as a kid, that was so depressing to me. The it idea, is depressing. The idea still. that there's no more like mystery. There's nothing to discover. And y- y- we all grow up with stories about uh, expeditions of like great men and women who, like Amelia Earhart, who like went around the world but disappeared, or like uh, uh, Winston Churchill, who like traveled to Africa and hunted large game, and Theodore Roosevelt, things like that. Yeah. Um, I loved that time and that era. And I also think about exploration of exploration expeditions. Mm -hmm. It was like, we didn't know what the was on Antarctica. No, but we sent people down there. We're like, we're going to find out. Yeah. And so many failed expeditions. And it was back in the time. Like, uh, I also think of like the world or, um, the lost city of Z. Like there's all these like tall tale myth, urban legends about these mythical places that people wanted to discover. Yeah. There, There is a story. And we talked about this where like, a lot of them come back unsubstantiated. We're like where we we thought that this existed, right? Mm-hmm. And then it's like we sent people there, and it's like that was all bullshit. Yeah, yeah. Did you hear? Have you ever heard the the myth or the story about like the man eating tree? So DJ, there was like a kid. There were there was a kid in uh, who I don't know how if he was just a trust fund kid in the eighteen hundreds. Uh, and traveled to Madagascar uh, to vlog for his YouTube and his friends. <laughs> Great content. And uh, he he wrote home about this experience where he watched a woman in Madagascar walking by this tree, and this tree smashed her <laughs> with a leaf the size of a car, just whomping willow. Yeah, straight up, fuck? dude. And uh, like ate her up like one of those uh, those gourd plants. Uh, Carnivorous Venus flytrap or something? Yeah, like Victory oh, Bell kind of thing. Shit. So, and he wrote home about that. So people were like, there's man eating trees in Madagascar. And there's so many things like from the 1800s and before that where like people wrote home about and like it turned into rumors and became at expeditions to where a lot of these people would travel. And a lot of them were uh, not spoofs, but just bust, you know? It's just um, classic game of telephone. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> There was one that uh, sounded more substantial uh, that happened like in the like the mid 1900s in India. There were rumors from I believe it. the local community talking about <laughs> this man who quote had a strange control over animals. So Beastmaster, Doctor Doolittle, yeah, the British. <laughs> um, <laughs> it the, would be a doctor if it was Indian. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> checks out dude um so uh the british uh sent like a team to go look for it and they were going through like the thick jungle couldn't find anything just when they're about to give up it was like their last night and they set up camp and they're resting when they hear this strange shrill scream in the jungle that didn't sound reminiscent of anything else they knew so immediately they started climbing they get out of their tents they go up some trees to hide no to get a better viewpoint to see if they could see anything one individual in particular climbs up and comes face to face with a tall man which i don't know is asia so that's not very common <laughs> and so he was like five foot eight <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so um he comes face to face with this man and uh he's not wearing any clothes and this man like makes another call 
and he the the British dude hears some ru- rustling behind him, and jumping over him is a Bengal tiger. Bruh. Bengal tiger perches next next to him on another branch next to the to the Mowgli. big guy, and uh, this was like a, like a real Tarzan that they called it or Mowgli, dude, Jungle Book, Mowgli too. Uh, the British, what do they do? Colonize, start shooting. At <laughs> exactly, <him. laughs> they pull out their blunderbuss <laughs> and bust down. And uh, why can't we? Uh, why can't we just be friends? No, yeah, we got to shoot the thing. <laughs> um, but uh, it got away. Tarzan got away. Yeah, so many stories like that where uh, I don't know they uh, go on expeditions looking for looking for the woolly mammoth, looking for dinosaurs in in the Congo, uh, looking for treasure in like the Gold Coast of Australia, and spending years, time, energy, resources, and most of them not coming back from anything, but they stemmed from something, you know, a rumor. Yeah. And uh, I get it, like the curiosity's peaked. You know. Oh yeah, I love it. Enough for them to expend and and go out and see. I uh, just to cover a couple of those. There is a story, eighteen hundreds, some shit, seventeen hundreds. I don't know. An explorer goes and travels to South America, and he travels through the Nile. Mm-hmm. And when In he South America, yes. Apologies. Did Amazon? I say Yeah. Yeah. What the f- <laughs> dude? <laughs> Brittany, cut that. Let's start. I said the Nile. Damn. This explorer travels to the Americas and goes through. I almost said it again. <laughs> okay, you can't cut it now. Uh, the Mississippi. Yeah. <laughs> he, he goes through the Amazon. And when he gets back, he gets through the other side and he goes back to Europe. He, he tells them, dude, there is millions of people, millions of people over there. Huge cities, cities of gold. There's agriculture. There's temples. There's, and he tells them all these stories. And they're like, what the? Gold, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all they hear. They're like, say less, yeah, yeah. What? Say what? So anyway, several years later, they get money, they get funding, and they go back. And when they go back, there's nothing. It's jungle. They go through the whole Amazon, and it's like they don't see shit. They just see jungle, dense jungle. And they're like, man, this mofo lied. <laughs> and that's kind of like the the story of the lost world, uh, lost, lost city of Z, lost, lost city of Z. Mm-hmm. So there's all these stories of these cities of gold and these huge cities, and they're like, damn. And for a really long time, up until a couple years ago, we thought that was all cap. We thought that was all lies. It's now true, but in South Dakota, the city of gold was discovered by Nick Cage. Okay. And- <laughs> but in the Amazon, what's going on is they're hitting it with LIDAR and they're mapping. And they've only done a small percentage of the Amazon. And already there's like, holy shit, under the super dense rainforest, there is infrastructure for millions of people to be of living in living in full on cities with byways, houses, temples, like yeah. and we're just swallowed by by time the forest, and the jungle. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened is disease was introduced and mm. killed off all these people and the classic the dude. jungle reclaimed so fast. So like way faster than you think. Uh reclaimed all these buildings. And so for hundreds of years, people were like walking by pyramids they had no idea no idea they thought it was a hill holy hell yeah so anyway there is now like we're proving the validity to some of these old ancient stories yeah and that sent me down looking for ancient expeditions or or a lost forgotten expeditions and i found one that we're going to cover tonight so we're going to do a deep dive tonight in this expedition Ooh. and uh i will start by saying in the heart of moscow Whoa. We Pretty travel fit. to a to a renowned museum that holds many treasures and recordings, over 500 painting, paintings, two journals that recount this story of a specific expedition. I feel like I'm in an episode of Mysteries of the Museum right now. Buckle bro. up, bitch. We're going. <laughs> okay. So this story is crazy. It has like everything I love. Mystery. Death. Uh, lost artifacts, magical uh, stones. <laughs> it has spies. Some Indiana Jones shit. It feels straight up like a D&D quest, and I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how well they roll. E. Where are we? 1920s in New York, in a small apartment. Uh, Wait, are, you done, are you done with Moscow? Yeah, we, we've moved. Wow, shoot. Oh, We're fast. now in New York. Oh, okay. okay. Um, Moscow is just the setting of where the story is contained right now. Mm -hmm. But the beginning of the story is in New York. So small apartment in New York, a Russian couple with thick Russian accents are living. 
when out of nowhere, the wife is visited by a powerful entity. She's possessed almost. She sees visions. And the entity is known as Mr. Moria. Mr. Moria. Oh, like Minds of Moria. Uh, p- apologies, Master Moria. Master, Master Moria. Moria. <laughs> <laughs> what she sees, she sees visions of an ancient civilization, lost knowledge, this mythical people who are like super advanced. And uh, the location of it vaguely is somewhere in the east. Okay. So let's talk about Master Moria. Master Moria is a notorious figure in the occult religion of theosophy. Oh. So Master Moria is a part of a group known as the Masters of Ancient Wisdom. And they pop up throughout history and throughout occult history specifically to teach humans about like lost forgotten knowledge and ways that we can elevate our consciousness as a a whole, Mm -hmm. like a group of people. So she's visited by this like heavy hitter, Master Moria. And when she comes out of her vision, she looks at her husband and talks to him and tells him about what she saw, what she witnessed. And she's convinced to the point, and he's convinced to the point, that they now dedicate their entire life, this is now their mission, to find what she saw in her vision. Damn. These two, let's talk about them. It is Nicholas and Helen Rorick. Rorick. A Russian couple. These two are like at the height of their careers. The husband, Nicholas, he's a writer. He's a painter. He's a poet, um, philosopher. Over the course of his life, he's nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize twice. Damn. He's doing a ton of work. Helen, she's like a, a writer as well, a philosopher as well. She has visions. She can heal. She can divine. And they're both really in tune with like the other side, right? And now the world at this time in the 1920s, them being Russian, they're in a crazy political landscape where like mm. World War One is happening. Mm-hmm. Great, Great Depression. Great Depression is right popping before. off. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. They are seeing the, the trajectory of the world. It's headed into world war. And they are like, we need to save mankind. Oh, the real comrades here. <laughs> Dude, yeah. Uh, they are, yeah. They, they like escaped Bolshevik Russia. The Russian Warrens. The newly USSR is established and is like quickly growing in power. And uh, the fight for like mankind is on. And they, they take it upon themselves. They're like, we have to find your vision to save mankind. Eurovision. <laughs> <laughs> so they drop everything they have to embark on this expedition. And this expedition lasts more than five years, taking them Damn. through the highest of highs, lowest of lows, deserts, That's mountains, snow. And uh, we'll see where it ends. So to dive a little bit deeper into who Nicholas is, Nicholas is a Russian dude who earlier in his life studied with someone who taught like one of the Dalai Lamas. Wow. So he like, he was working on the very first Buddhist temple to ever be built in Russia. So he's very connected. In talking to this Dalai Lama, or this teacher, this teacher tells him about a lost knowledge of a lost civilization known as Shambhala. It's known to be home to an ancient advanced race who has like super advanced weaponry, but also the means to like bring humankind to the next level in evolution. Oh, shit. So it's this lost forgotten civilization. They have artifacts there. It's essentially like Asia's philosopher's stone. So it's like a magical stone that like, if you touch, you can see the future and past and you can have like a prolonged life. Damn. And it has like ancient or advanced weaponry that like soon the entire world will be really interested in finding to win the war. Mm. Shambhala is so, like uh, Asia's Atlantis. It pretty much. feels like. Damn. Very similar story. Same vibes. Uh, anyway, he tells him about this place and he goes, I don't know if it's real or not. It might just be metaphorical. Like we all need to reach this enlightened spot. Mm -hmm. He's like, but you know, there's evidence that it could be out there. So this sort of informs him when he hears his wife who has this vision, he puts that, what he already knows, what she sees together. And they're like, okay, this shit's real. We got to find it to save mankind. So they start this trek. They start this journey. It's Helen, Nicholas, and they bring their son, Benedict Cumberbatch. George. <laughs> close. Very, cl- very just, close. Just a, just a bunch of whites going up and somehow becoming the leaders of the of the elite people. Yeah. <laughs> that know magic. They talk to the Oracle. 
Yeah, oh, obviously, dude. How do they get to, <laughs> they get to Nepal like this? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They, they open, open up, up that, that portal. portal from New York. <laughs> Find Shambhala. Yeah, it's been found. Dude, hell yeah. That's uh, a lot of that actually. Like uh, Doctor Strange, the Tibetan monk shit is like that's real. This is where it started. Yeah, the war we're about to talk about, and then it's been bastardized and then like shit on by Marvel. And yeah, <laughs> now you can write a roller coaster about it. <laughs> yeah, for real. Anyway, okay, so. The Roricks. Let's talk about it. It's Nicholas Rorick, his wife Helen, and they decide to bring their son, who luckily is a famous, renowned Tibetanologist. He knows random. A, yeah, he knows a lot of the dialect of Tibet. How though? <laughs> and then um and a, a team of six people come with them. Okay. So they make their way over to the east. They get their funding and they land in Darjeeling, India. Okay. At the at the foot of the Himalayas. Okay. And they are all dressed up in like robes. They look like in traditional clothing of the Dalai Lama. Mm-hmm. And immediately they're met with a ton of opposition. Question. Let's hear it. When they were told about this, when he was told about this from like the person who taught the Dalai Lama or whatever, was there something that indicated it was going to be in Thai, in Tibet or like? Yes. We'll get okay. to that. Okay. So why? Yeah. That's, let's start with Tibet though. And the Himalayas. And let's kind okay. of paint that picture. So is this Darjeeling Limited? I, Have you I, seen that? I don't know how that's related, but I'm sure it's gotta it be has somehow, to be something. Right? Yeah. It's so it's uh like a earlier Wes Anderson. Yes. Oh, what the it's just like brothers who travel through India on a train and so oh, yeah. for sure. Then yeah. yeah, that's what they're doing. Well, this is the same thing. Um <laughs> same same. This was all directed by Wes Anderson. So they land in Darjeeling, they're immediately met by opposition. Mm-hmm. Locals don't like outsiders. The authorities, Surprise. <laughs> the, the authorities don't like outsiders. Sick. And uh, Tibet is a very politically tumultuous place at this time. It's, it's, I think still is to this day. Wouldn't so be surprised. Let's talk well, about Well, yeah, China's there and like that's their history. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it, Deej? I, I know a little bit. Tell us. They were pretty, they expanded a lot. They were like a huge empire, right? Massive, yeah. Uh, to the point where if that still existed today, it would be bigger than India. Like it would be like the Their seventh empire. Like Damn. The sixth or seventh biggest country in the world. Yeah. But the story goes, you have a lot of power. Everyone's going to want a piece of it. So over time, they were taken over more or less, right? Because you had uh, the Middle East right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you had China, all the other countries on the other side. So, and then India took some of it. Yeah, it's like, like over Pakistan, time, they just, China, exactly, they, Mongolia. chipped away. They have their own culture. They had Buddhism. They have uh, their own language, Tibetan. Yeah. Obviously, extremely uh, harsh environment. I think like the lowest point of Tibet is like 4,000 feet up in the (laughs) sky, which is the average here in Utah. So it's like it's it, it has a rich history and they're still like battling China kind of China. I think uh, oppressed makes sense. Yeah, super oppressed. Uh, China found like I forgot it was like in the billions, fifty billion dollars plus more worth of like mineral mineral deposits. So as soon as they found that, they're like, "That's ours. <laughs> We're gonna take that." And uh, just over time, have the people have fought against foreign invaders, and just the environment in th- itself is like really harsh, being so high up, super cold. Mm -hmm. so that that's like also taken on like the people that's like in their dna their bodies are more used to like that harsher climate like their genetic makeup is really unique to that specific case everest is there too so it's just pretty sure like 13 of like the highest peaks in the world are all right there yeah in the chinese and nepalese himalayan mountains so to sum it up, historically, politically, super tumultuous. But then the geography of the place, mm-hmm. harshest in the world, highest mountains in the world, coldest temperatures. <clears throat> like uh, Sean and I have watched a couple of documentaries recently on it. It's like there's mountain roads that you can pass for like a month out of the year because the the, the snow is just wild. Yeah. It's not plowed. Everything is against you like here. And this is... While the Roricks were doing this, this is way back in the day. In the 1920s. Yeah, in the 1920s. So this is where they're headed to find the famous mythical land of Shambhala. 
So let's talk it's about in Shim- Tibet or Nepal. Uh, it, Tibet. In, yes. Tibet. Yeah. And Tibet is where the Dalai Lama is. Yes. Dalai Lama is basically the religious leader. leader. It's it's the regi- religious leader, but also by proxy, like political leader too. Not like a president. They're not a president or governor, mm-hmm. but they they don't have they don't have a president, right? The uh-huh. Dalai Lama kind of well, Tibet is still that. technically China. Yeah. So politically, it's like there's a it's lot a region, of, yeah. right? It's a region of China. Yeah, but China, China, China China's doesn't like, mess with we Tibet. We own you, but yeah. we're going to let constantly, you do your thing. Constantly oppressing them. Yeah. So anyway, like you're saying, the Dalai Lama, their leader. It's actually said that the Dalai Lama derives his power from Shambhala. Mm. So let's talk about it. What is Shambhala? What are they on their expedition expedition to find? We've we talked about it a little bit, but it's a mythical lost civilization. It's like Atlantis of the East, technologically, spiritually advanced godlike people mm-hmm. are live in this mythical place in this region way in the himalayas and uh they hold the secrets of like living forever and advanced technology shambhala is talked about in all of the ancient texts of that area mongolia china tibet they all talk about this mythical place mm-hmm. and if you go back long enough these texts talk about them as if they are a real place mm-hmm. now it's like figurative or it's like a, it's a metaphor but if you go back far enough they all talked about like no you can pull up on shambhala you can go there it's called like different names in different different cultures but it's all essentially the same thing and then jump yeah. in anytime if if this like overlaps with shangri-la uh, well it is essentially shangri-la so in pakistan is it pakistan so in yeah the high mountains of pakistan and like tibet shangri la is a fictional location that was written about in a book but it was derived from this location shambhala okay perfect. and then they made a movie about this book hollywood just doing their thing yeah that kind of popularized shangri la and that's what everyone when you say like Shangri La, they it will envision like this perfect society out in the mountains with people who live long and everything you've said about Shambhala. Because Shambhala was of, what they based Shangri La on. That makes a lot more sense. So Shambhala is known, it's talked about in these ancient texts as if it's real, and it's known to be the capital of Agartha. Oh. Have you ever heard of Agartha? Yes. That sounds very familiar. DJ? Yeah, we've talked about Agartha. Agartha is the subterranean hollow earth <sighs> nation. Okay, so we're not going to dive deep into Agartha. <laughs> Agartha is going to have its own segment. But just know so many of the theories and ideas and ideologies are all like stem from Agartha. The Nazis went to Antarctica to look for Agartha. The Nazis, yeah, like it, during this time, like... The Russians, the Nazis, the U.S., we were doing it too. Everyone was looking. Looking for these ancient lost technologies and weapons. And Agartha is the root of so much of it. Very quickly, Agartha is the inner subterranean, like in Hollow Earth. It's where the elite, the godlike people, they live to this day. And they are waiting for the Earth to reach a point where they can get on their level. Yeah. And then they'll come and like help us elevate. Well, there's actually in, I, I think it's Hindu text where Shambhala is where in 2424, so 2424, the world will be at war and a leader will rise and save everyone from Shambhala will save the world or something. Yeah. But that's in like there's a very, years there's a very specific like prophecy. Yeah, yeah. That, that save talks the world about from Shambhala. No, no, no. Save the world. Uh, he'll uh, arise in Shambhala. Oh, oh, out right, of I Shambhala. Think, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So these ancient texts talk about Shambhala as if it's a real place. They have like specific lineages recorded, so they'll tell you like the leader of Shambhala for hundreds and hundreds of years, generations. Uh, they'll tell you exactly where it is, and it, or, or at least where it comes from, and they say that the entrance to Shambhala is west of Mount Kalish. So it's a very specific part yeah. in the Himalayas. Hmm. And it's like some of the hardest terrain there. Jeez, we're not even... <laughs> not even scratching the surface, where, dude. Where are the Rorik's at? <laughs> so they have landed in Darjeeling. They're immediately accosted by authorities. They're like, what the hell are you doing here? The mountains of uh, the Himalayas are like tribes of marauders, tribes of warlords, 
mm-hmm. warring people, people who are very skeptical. So it's like they have to move very carefully. And uh, they tell them, hey, we are doing an expedition to record and document art of Central Asia, which isn't completely a lie. Because Technically, yeah. Over the course of this expedition, which I told you lasts five years, Nicholas Rorick paints over 500 paintings oh. that have to depict their, this expedition. Hmm. And he keeps two journals. One journal is strictly to record all the scientific findings, the facts, the daily things that go on. Yeah. The second he uses to record his more esoteric experiences. So any visions, any weird encounters, anything mm-hmm. that might like be extra or supernatural or, or like not of this world, yeah. he keeps that second journal. So they start off. They have to lie. They have to move carefully. It's a team of the three and then the six with them. Mm-hmm. Um, they start going and traveling through this land. They go to the highest peaks. They go to the lowest lows of, of the Himalayas. At one point, they're crossing the Gobi Desert. And he makes a, a an entry in his journal, and he basically says, "Like, is the beating heart of Asia, like smothered by sand?" He's like, "There's no life out here. It's so hard." Yeah, uh, they're chased by marauders. <laughs> they're captured. Bro. At one point, their uh, their horses are poisoned, and a lot of them are killed. Holy cow! So it's a struggle, to say the least. A struggle that lasts five years. They at, during their time, they peak. 35 mountain passes they cover over 21,000 feet of elevation they travel 15,000 miles of uncharted road bro why is this not a movie you're telling me yeah at one point they realize as they're moving they're being followed oh shit british united states and russia are all very interested in what's happening on this expedition so they're being tailed by spies closely That's equally scary. I thought you were going to say something like supernatural, like some <laughs> some, some Smeagol ass creature, some like Smeagol spies, bro. Dude, yeah. essentially, just a British. I yeah. mean, Brit, Brit it was, it was Master Moria, dude. Yeah. Oh, sh- <laughs> true. So they're being like surveilled, and their movements are being tracked, not mm-hmm. only by like marauders, Tibetans, but and also now spies, spies. Sick. After like four four years, Nicholas, his entries in the scientific journal become less and less. And the esoteric journal becomes more and more. Interesting. He starts having daily visions. And he starts being visited by a specific entity. And this entity reveals itself as the spirit of a former ruler of Shambhala. What? And it's communicating with them. And it's saying, you were close. (laughs) Keep going. You're going to find it. Keep going. And they're like battling for their life up these mountains. Yeah. And so we, they keep going. Oh. Spies are closing in. Fate is dark. Food, supply, they're ravished, they're weak, they're tired. They're being hunted. And the entire party disappears. What? Every single one of them. Well, I, w- The spies are flabbergasted. They don't know where they went. They disappear for 12 months. Holy cow. What? No. Okay. It's- there's one last entry in the journal before they disappear. So they just leave all of their stuff. Uh, I'll just and I'll, they disappear. I'll explain. The last entry before they disappear talks about an early morning in camp. They're making food, a fire's going. The seven of them are sitting out there, or however many of them are, or whatever. Um, they're sitting out, and they notice in the valley this large black eagle is flying up above their camp, and it's the biggest eagle they've ever seen they all are just like silently marveling at this big ass eagle the eagles dude <laughs> tell me this is lord of the rings <laughs> this is why everyone is left-handed nor oh shout out monks and as the eagle's soaring one of the party goes like yells look higher and they all look up higher and floating in the sky is a cylindrical metal ob- object with no visible propulsion shiny and this thing moves across their camp and then with insane speed that they can't comprehend switches direction and takes off and disappears into the blue sky bro was this the who, wait who is this from this is the the whole part the Rorix? yes witness this, the this. after they come back no right before they disappear right before, before and is the, this yeah. in their uh his journal. Which journal? The I want to say scientific, scientific one. I want to say oh scientific. Oh my gosh, bro. But 
what's crazier. So all of us hear that. And what do you think? X-Files. UFO, right? UFO. Dude, in the 20s. What's crazy is this is in the 20s before the idea of UFOs are even a thing. Because Roswell hasn't even happened. Nope. The the zeitgeist of a cylindrical shiny UFO is not a thing doesn't yet. exist yet. Yeah. There's no there's not even foil to make a tin hat. There you go. <laughs> we don't even had that shit. So they record this in the journal. This is the last entry, and they disappear, stumping spies of several uh, <laughs> they nations. They like all get together and like, whoa, what's going on? No one knows where they go. <sighs> when twelve months later, they reappear. They come back defeated. Several of them are dead. They, like actually dead. Dead. Holy and they shit. make their way back to the U.S. Their expedition is widely regarded as a failure. And they come back to the U.S. They found nothing. No Shambhala. They have no artifacts of mythical uh, abilities. Master Moria forsaken them. They failed. I don't believe it for a second. So after a while, when they're home, they publish Nicholas's journal. And his journal talks about how out of the 12 months, the last five months, they spent in a Tibetan prison camp. And the abuse and the torture that they endured was so bad that five of them died. Damn. But it also talks about one more experience that leaves a lot of people to think, maybe this wasn't a failure. So right before they disappear, they have one more account. They are in the valley. The valley. These are the Rorics, by the way. On the left is Nicholas. Bro, they is for sure explorers. Hiding behind almost is Helen. And on the right is George. Dude, I'm this this is me profiling, but he looks hella Asian. <laughs> he's got the beard, he's got the hat for it. He's full on Buddhist. He's, so he's about that life. Bro. Yeah, he's sage, dude. You're damn. This get up too. <laughs> Hot. Okay. They, they rolled up into That's, Tibet like this. Explore core, bro. Explore core. <laughs> Dude, I'm I'm kind of with that. Same, bro. bro. Expedition core. <laughs> Let's start it right now, bro. <laughs> Tibet Fashion Week, 1922. Skirt. Okay. So his his journals are published. People are reading through them, and people come across this entry that makes people wonder. And this entry talks about right before they disappeared, they're in the valley of Uman. Uman. Super remote. Super crazy, way high up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And in this valley, they're met met by a monk, an ancient old monk, who takes them up these crazy stairs into this old stone Buddhist temple. It looks ancient. It feels ancient. He meets them, and he says, come with me. And he leads them behind the temple. And behind the temple, in the side of the mountain, they can see a huge entrance to a cave. But 99% of this entrance is like stoned up by perfectly cut stones. So it's all covered. And there's a small like entrance. And Nicholas Rurik says that the monk tells them, speak friend, <laughs> speak friend <laughs> and enter. <laughs> no, he says, this is the entrance to Shambhala. <gasps> and you are not allowed to enter. Sick. Oh. And that's all the, the all the interest. There's like and then they seven of us, one of you. And then they disappear for a year. That's the last thing we hear. Yes. Bro, that's dirty. Until they reappear and they say, and they come back and like, yeah, we failed. We failed. But many people are like, I don't know. Because very soon after this, after they come back, after his journals are published, they are approached by the United States government. Of course. And FDR funds New Deal another expedition and the Roricks travel back to the Himalayas for their second expedition to find Shambhala. And we will cover that second expedition next week. Damn. Because <laughs> we've reached our limit. But th this, the re all of this, the U.S. interest, the Russian interest, uh, the fact these weird entries and the fact that they're sending them back, so many people are like, dude. They 100% found they, it. They found it. Guaranteed. Okay. So we will cover the next week and we'll go a little bit deeper into Agartha, Agartha. and other subterranean hollow earth <laughs> theories. Uh, real quick, I want to cover my sources. I found a YouTuber named Mr. Mythos. Okay. Dope, dude. 
research crazy. If you guys are interested, definitely check out his YouTube, like hour long uh, videos on, on subjects. But if you guys like think this was fun, this story is fun, check out his YouTube. He does way better research than we could ever do. Like he has a whole page <laughs> of his sites and it's like he, this mofo reads books, you know what I'm Damn. saying? Damn. Yeah. So anyway, that's where we end. The Roricks are heading back to the Himalayas. Even after a five year uh, st- and then a stint in a Tibetan death camp and then five of them die, it's like they're heading back. Bro, this is making me want to go explore. It should, dude. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking like, are is anybody currently exploring? Looking, exploring? Yes. Like for some things that Shambhala? are happening. Oh, I don't know about Shambhala. Okay. Some things that are happening in the world right now. By 2024, they plan on reintroducing woolly mammoths. I heard about to that, the tundra dude. of like Siberia or some shit. That's wild. Apparently, they have a park there with CRISPR technology, which is gene editing technology. Uh, they've take they have enough DNA from woolly mammoths, <sighs> and they're going to finish that DNA sequencing with Indian elephants. Bro, this is a Jurassic mistake. Bro. And they, by 2024, <laughs> in our lifetime, are going to reintroduce woolly mammoths to like the the tundra the bruh earth. i mean they've been uh making babies outside of the womb that's terrifying bro. that's true that's a soulless baby <laughs> just kidding no judgment dude. whoa dude yeah you just what are those, those pronouns of those babies it yeah <laughs> Shit, sorry it, sorry it, the okay other things that are happening right now in the world dude they recently found a butcher site that shows evidence of butchered animals with tools that they've dated back to, I just want to make sure I have the number in my head, 2.9 million years ago. Well, that's not possible. Bro. <laughs> so, like, these things are happening right now. There is potential evidence, like, in Antarctica. Like, advanced tools from 2.9 years ago? Not advanced uh, tools, but, like... Just tools? A hominid, a homo... Not a homo sapien. It's, like, a different family. Yeah, it's, like, a... Was using tools 2.9 million years ago. Damn. That's like way further back than we ever thought. There is evidence. I don't know how real it is, but there's aerial footage in of like a, a pyramid in Antarctica. Bro, I saw that. Right? That is wild looking. So there's still mysteries out there, dude. There's dude. There, there's supposed to be pyramids in uh in China. Dude, there's hella pyramids. Oh, in yeah. China. Like they underground us, too. Like they won't let us uh, they don't talk about it. No. And, and they because they're not as great. <laughs> <laughs> They've already got uh, another thing great. They got the the, the, got wall. the great wall. Yeah, not as great. <laughs> yeah, so they're not they're not the top. Yeah. They're uh, pyramid. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was DJ's joke from last week. I stole it. <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, I know. I was, I was trying covering. to set you up for it. Uh, yeah. So I love the idea that there's mysteries out there. That there's oh, still yeah. things to be explored. That's so sick. And next week or whenever we record again, we are going to dive deeper into this expedition and maybe cover some more. So that's kind of going to wrap up the pod. I'm going to close there with that. Anything else, gentlemen? No. Thank you so much to all everyone who listens and supports and sends in stories. Continue to send them in, uh, hit up our website. There's a place where you could submit. It's the three M podcast.com. Ask everyone around you for stories. We're going to do a user sub user submission story episode soon okay we appreciate you all we love you thanks to everyone who reached out to wanting to support i don't know why i can't say this anyway (laughs) until next week bye love you be safe trust your gut and watch your back be careful out there goodbye hey thank you so much for tuning into this episode of 3 a.m If you want to support us, visit our Patreon where patrons have access to exclusive content. If you're not able to support us monetarily, don't worry. This episode is on us. You can still rate and review us on whatever platform you listen to us on. It really does go a long way. You can also follow us on social media. Our handle everywhere, including Patreon, is the 3AM pod. Finally, do you have any scary stories? If so, submit them to our website, the3ampodcast.com. We love any audio or visual aids that can help bring your stories to life. So file uploads are welcome with your written submissions. We're anxious and excited to hear from you.